Welcome to Discover the Showboat, a city at sea, a collection of video tours presented by Battleship Volunteers. Battleship North Carolina, an extraordinary ship that steamed into history. In these videos, enjoy the compartments, equipment, documents, and photographs, and hear the stories that celebrate the young men who proudly served on the most highly decorated American battleship of World War II, their home. Hi, I'm Cecil Ard, I'm a volunteer aboard the USS North Carolina. Currently standing in the ship's soda fountain, and yeah, I did say soda fountain. You may wonder why. Why would they go through the time and the trouble and the effort and the expense to put a soda fountain aboard a battleship? Well, if you go back in time a little, in uh, 1919, the 18th Amendment was passed for the Constitution, which banned all transportation, manufacture, and sales of alcoholic beverages. Well, brewer breweries such as Stroh's and Yingling had to figure out a way to survive. So they went to near beer, which is 0.05%, which was still legal, but it still wasn't enough. So what Yingling did was across from their brewery up in Pennsylvania, they built a dairy. Uh, they came in started making ice cream. Well, folks didn't have the bars to go hang out anymore, so what they started doing was going to ice cream parlors and soda fountains to socialize. And Yingling promoted that and had a lot to do with it. And in that case, they survived. Uh, ice cream was so important by the time of World War II that the guys that were aboard the USS Lexington in 1942, as she was sinking after being torpedoed, broke into the soda fountain and ate every bit of ice cream in there before they went overboard while the ship was sinking. So you take 2,000 guys, you know, more or less, you shove them into a ship, very hot, you know, it was always above 100 degrees, well, pretty much always, and there was no way to go to get away from the heat. Nothing to do, they worked four hour watches, so watches would be uh, start at 4 a.m., go four to eight, eight to noon, noon to four, four to eight, eight to noon, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You might work one watch, be off a watch or two. You might work a couple watches, be off a couple watches. You really didn't know. It depended on your assignment where you worked. For the time you were off, you had to have something to do. You had to have something to look forward to. Usually by the end of the day, it was hot, and as one of the, the crew members put it, the hottest part of the day when your mouth was the driest, you just really need something, water wasn't working. So it gave them something to look forward to toward the end of the day before they went and crawled in the bed and tried to sleep through sweat all night. How this worked is basically ice cream was made across the ship. Originally, it was made in here. And what we're thinking is it was about a two and a half gallon machine which just did not give them enough to keep up with the demand from the guys. The guys would line up in long lines. They said every time the ice cream uh, soda fountain was open, lines were very long. So they moved over to the other side of the ship. They made space. They made it in five-gallon batches over there. So apparently, and truthfully, temperature is very important in producing ice cream. So the machine over here produces it soft serve, kind of like what comes out in your convenience stores and things when you swirl it into a little cone and eat it soft. So it comes out at 23 degrees. Well, you're in a ship that could average 100 degrees most of the time. You can't leave it there very long. So what they would do is they would take it and immediately place it, and it was in these five gallon cans here, containers, immediately place it in this hardening cabinet. So I have four compartments in two cabinets. Each one of these will hold 20 gallons, so I can store 80 gallons in here. It is stored at minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit, so if you leave it in here very long, it hardens up over about six hours, and if you tried to dip it at minus 15 degrees Fahrenheit, it would be try trying to dip a brick. So they would bring it over here to the serving cabinet. So this serving cabinet has five bays that will hold 10 gallons each, so I can hold 50 gallons over here. This operates at plus five degrees Fahrenheit. So what that does is when you bring it here and you store it in here, it allows the ice cream to soften up enough that you can actually dip it, but it's still cold enough and hard enough that it remains ice cream long enough for these guys to eat. Servings were half cup, basically, which is about eight decent tablespoons. You could get it in plain ice cream, which was five cents. 
you can get it in pints, and these are not the actual uh, containers. These are ones you can't really find the ones from the 40s, but this is a pint size. This was 15 cents. You could get a soda for five cents, or you could get a Sunday for 15 cents. The way the fountain operates, well, let's talk about, back up a minute, and talk about they opened the hours. They opened from 1.30 to 3.30 every day the ship was in service. And when the ship was out at sea, they would open an additional 6.30 to 10 in the evening. So the way it operates is we have a pump here. This is just a compressor. So this is called a carbonator. This compressor takes carbon dioxide from the tanks that are sitting over to your side over here, compresses it into this frigid cooling tower up here, and the water is also cooled in here, which is why it's called the cooling tower. And then as you pump your flavors, so each one of these had flavorings, whatever you wanted, you could choose. I have 14 different pumps in here. Don't know if it's actually what they had. I can't say it's exactly what was in here, but it is appropriate for the time and it is all period correct. So you would take your glass or your four ounce. So back up a second to servings. Servings came in four ounce, which were standard serving, it's half cup or eight ounce. And then a little bit later on, developed into the 10 ounce, which was considered a very large serving here. So what you would do is four, eight, or 10 ounce, you would get a certain number of pumps from your flavor. This is your cold carbonated water. They would shoot that in, then they would mix it, and you have your soda. When you go to a Circle K or a convenience store now, or anywhere you go, and you press your cup into the machine, that is exactly the same this does. It just does it automatically. It's an automatic soda fountain, so they do still exist. So you pulled your four-hour watch. It's really hot. You're just really thirsty. You want something. You come down here. You wait in the long line. You get to the fountain, and just plain vanilla half-cup scoop is not going to do it. What options of flavoring did we have? So on the fountain, and the way this works is the syrups come in gallon jars. This is a period dad's root beer. This orange is actual orange. It wasn't, it's never been emptied. This is the original. So it does, it's not orange color, it's this, but it tastes like orange. Uh, some of the things we found on board were a walnut salad, a black walnut salad. So what it, this has in here, it was repurposed for uh, some type of machine oil or something they repurposed out of something and then stuck it on a shelf down below. You had a strawberry puree, which this was also found on board. That's what's oil all over it. And if you try to clean it up, it kind of does away with the labels. So we try not to do that, among other flavors. So up here, coming in the jugs, you would have Coca-Cola, root beer, chocolate, vanilla, cherry, orange, strawberry, pineapple, lemon, lime, butterscotch, coffee, plain, and maple. For as long as they lasted, you could also have the option of fresh fruits. You got blueberries, raspberries, uh, fresh cherries, fresh strawberries. And of course, one of my favorites growing up was orange aid. So you could do either do lemonade or you could do fresh orange aid. The end of the fountain down here, you had a couple of options. This is your you know, sink, of course. You also had a scoop and a small washer here with warm water. And you had a glass washer. So you put this in here, you shove it down, it shoots hot water up into the glasses and uh, washes those out for you. I also had a Hamilton Beach uh, milkshake machine in here, a mixer. This one is an Arnold. I haven't been able to find a Hamilton Beach Mix Master, uh, but this is the period, right period piece, and it would be very similar to what they had in here. So you could do malted milk, or you could do a regular milkshake. This is a little milk can here. You would get your ice cream and your flavorings. It hangs up into here and runs, and when it's done, you pull it out, go to your eight ounce cup, and you have your milkshake.
So you've come to the fountain, you've made it through, you decided what you want, you get to the register. At the register, if you get ice cream, you have the option, little wooden spoon. I'm sure a lot of you will remember these. I do from school, eating ice cream out of those. You also had the option of straws. Straws back then were paper, and they were in dispensers, and you just pull the dispenser up, and out comes your straw. One of the neat stories that I remember about the fountain came from uh, Bosun's mate, first class, Paul Weezer. He said, uh, September 15, 1942, about two in the afternoon. Those of you familiar with the ship, that would be a very significant date. I said it was trying to quote the best I can, but he said it was the hottest part of the day when your mouth was just the driest it could possibly be. He'd stood in line for a long time, finally got his Coke float. And what that was is they will mix you a Coca-Cola, they take a scoop of ice cream, drop it in the Coca-Cola, you mix it in, it's one of the best things in the world. I used to love Coke floats. Said he finally got through the line, got his Coke float, he was out here standing on the deck and mess decks back here. He was trying and did everything he could not to just gulp it down in one gulp. He said he'd stuck his little spoon in there and he got it mixed absolutely perfectly and all of a sudden he's standing there with ice cream running down his face, dripping off his chin, and he's looking at the bottom of an empty paper cup. So just about that time, General Quarters sounded. When General Quarters sounds, it doesn't matter what you were doing, you drop everything you're doing and you run straight to your battle station because something is about to happen or something very bad has happened. That day it was a very bad thing had happened. So he said he's standing there with his crumpled cup in his hand and they had been drilled so much not to throw things down on the deck he was kind of trying to figure out what he do, did, what to do with it. So he said, you know, I just finally realized that you know, I needed to go, so he crumpled it up, threw it down on the deck, and took off to a station. And that's always been a really interesting story to me. So the soda fountain didn't always look the way it does now. The ship came here, um, they used it, as a small canteen, or they called it the fountain, and they would serve water and sodas and things out of here during the summer. Uh, they had some folks from the gift shop who worked down here. Uh, this countertop was actually over here, welded to this wall. This carbonator was 100 feet down the ship in a storage area. Pump-wise, I had maybe three almost complete pumps, three more partial pumps, and everything else was an empty space. Uh, none of the, the cans or anything else was in here. And over the period of about three years, through the help of some folks who deal in soda fountain items, the one up in Pennsylvania and one out in California, and doing a lot of research, watching old movies, paying attention, uh, magazine ads, you kind of get a concept and an idea of what would have been here. You also you know, figure out what's available at the time. So this was cut off the wall. It was put back where it belonged. Ship was uh, gracious enough. We found this online and bought the register for in here. It does work. It's fully functional, but it's loud. And uh, we're not going to mess with it today. All the straws, these are different uh, versions of period straws. They were out there like they are today. Uh, I'm not sure how it happened, but I had searched for pumps. These are very specific pumps. They won't fit any other fountain, just this one. This is a Brunswick. And these are stainless. They're not ceramic or porcelain like most are. And they're very narrow and very deep. So there's nothing else. You can't substitute any other pumps in here. So I've almost given up. And I kept searching the eBay about every week or two, I would search, you know, antique vintage soda fountain. And all of a sudden, four popped up from a lady in, I believe it was in Pennsylvania. So I bought three of the four. She wanted to keep one for herself. About two months later, I had, I think it was five more from a, from a guy up in Michigan popped up. So by the time it was all over with, I ended up, with the 14 complete pumps I have here and the six spares I have down there and one, two of those are complete and a couple of them are missing parts. 
a very good friend of ours of the ships and a good volunteer, Doug Armstrong Machine. He's a very good machinist, machined some parts for me, and we finally got all, all these completed out. One of the hardest things also to find was these, were these little uh, porcelain or ceramic little flavor buttons. These don't come easy. Um, I had to buy, I had to search through eBay and Pinterest and find individual pumps with the flavor I wanted on, buy it, take the one off of it, and I was assuming, well, it was a bad idea, I was assuming that there were, there was only a standard size, well there are three, maybe four different sizes, so those had to be sliced and trimmed and ground and made to fit in here, which took a bit to do. One thing I cannot find is these are not original. So this is a cooling tower, a frigid cooling tower. These spouts here are basically came off of another fountain. Most fountains, this is down in the fountain and you see goosenecks that come out and over. And this is actually where your carbonated water comes from when you want it. This one is above and it's built like a beer tap that screws straight into it. So they're very, very hard to find. I'm going to have to find them specific to a fountain. Found one fountain. It was complete. It was $15,000. I just didn't have it in my pocket at the time. So that didn't happen. Um, all the other stuff, one piece at a time, usually one jug a week over a period of a couple years. Um, Pepsi Pete up here, he is a period piece. You know, he's Pepsi Cola. He's a double dot, which in the 1940s, you had your two dots here in the 19, late 40s and in the 50s you had single dot. And then they switched and went to a bottle cap. Uh, this is not an original, it is a correct repro. And it sort of matches my original carton down here, so this is an original carton. Later in the war, they went from a lot of the fountain stuff to bottles and they bought coke by, cokes by uh, like the tens of thousands of bottles by eight ounce bottles. So those bottles were all produced in North Carolina. The bottom of them, if you look at them, is what this, Forest, uh, Forest City, Charlotte, Asheville, I believe, are, are represented on there. Um, so for years of work and I had a, a lot of help from some really good people. You know, Fred and Gary helped me out doing a lot of the polishing and cleaning in here. Um, air gas gave me the cylinders to go in here, the carbon dioxide cylinders, so I have two here and two spares behind you guys. Um, it pretty much came together and this is what we ended up with and we're very proud of it. Thank you for watching Discover the Showboat, a collection of videos from the Battleship North Carolina in Wilmington, North Carolina. Visit us online at www battleshipnc.com. The showboat welcomes visitors daily. In 2020, the Battleship North Carolina received an NC Cares Humanities Relief Grant from the North Carolina Humanities Council, www.nchumanities.org. Funding for NC Cares has been provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities as part of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act Economic Stabilization Plan.